Our guest today is the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. He took office in 2014 and has had to lead the economy through falling oil prices, foreign exchange demands, a depleted foreign reserve amid global slowdown. He has had to weather this storm, stabilize the financial system, and promote economic growth. He is here today to share with us his outlook on what Nigerians can expect for the next half of the year. It is a pleasure to welcome the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Good morning, Mr. Emifile. How are you? Good morning, Biola Labi, and uh, it's nice to be at the Arise Studio, uh, Arise Studio. Right here uh, for at the heart this, of for this Nigeria's commercial show. capital. Great to be here, too. Thank you so much for right. being with us. Thank you. As we've said, you've had to store, you've had to stabilize the economy and actually weather quite a bit of storms against lots of global headwinds as well. One of the questions I wanted to ask you first of all was just really something that I was curious about. Before you took office, you, it, the central bank was sort of at the central of a lot of contra controversy with your predecessor and the former administration. As someone sort of watching this, because you had a cushy job at the time, you were, you were, you were working at the bank, what was your feeling when you got the call the first time you got the call to about this job? Well, um, you will um, have recalled that um, while the, the quest for um, exercession at the Central Bank of Nigeria um, was going on mm -hmm. sometime around the first half of 2014, a couple of names were being mentioned. As Lots to, of names. Yeah, soon <laughs> were being mentioned about the, the person, person mm -hmm. that will succeed. Um, um, the Emir of Kano, then the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, I didn't dream about it, I didn't think about it, but um, suddenly sitting at the corner, um, you find that you get called to come and serve your country, and what do you do if you, have, if you are faced with those circumstances? Um, then I had served already as f four years as the, as the managing director of Zenith Bank, and mm -hmm. um, I must say it was a very good time as being the MD, uh, of Zenith Bank at that time, and indeed at that time I had spent close to about 17 years on the board of Zenith Bank, two years as executive director, 11 years as deputy managing director, and four years as the MD. I'm being called to say, uh, come serve your country, and I think um, I thought it was a good, good, good idea, and um, uh, I took it on, uh, given that I wasn't one of those that was touted as the successor as the governor of Central Bank of Nigeria at that time. So they didn't have to call you multiple times before you said yes? You said yes on the first call? Uh, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, those are not the details. I think uh, we should leave the details for some other time. But the important thing is that I got a call from somewhere. I just didn't know where it was coming from. And um, I was just informed, well, that um, you have, we have looked at you for several years and we think um, you you will, f you will be able to fit the shoe. And, um, and uh, initially I resisted it, <clears throat> to be honest, and I thought because I didn't ask for this. And um, I was wondering why, why me, why me? And, um, but have, having spoken to a couple of people, I didn't have a choice because it was meant to be a call to national service sure. and uh, we felt, let's, let's, take a, let's take a shoot at it. Fantastic. One of the things you said in your earlier speeches, um, what, and I'm going to quote you here, so please um, give me a minute. You said the central bank, that it, you're going to create a central bank that is professional, that is apolitical, and people-focused, and you're going to um, pursue the reduction of interest rates. One of the things that really stood out to me was apolitical. Do you believe that a central bank, especially in a place like Nigeria, and even if you look globally, do you believe that the central bank can be apolitical? Um, the truth is that yes, central bank can be apolitical, and that is the reason you find in different climes, in practically almost all the countries in the world, that the central bank, um, central bank's mandate has been uh, one where, uh, in, the, in the acts establishing the central banks or the Fed, uh, central banks have been seen to be independent, mm -hmm. so they will be, um, they will not be subjected to the whims and caprices of the political authorities. And that has happened in different, many, many countries in the world. And that's the reason we say, yes, a central bank can be apolitical. And in sort of meeting your other goals, which is basically to create a central bank that is, more prof that is professional, that is focused on a reduction of interest rates, how do you feel the central bank has fared three years into your appointment? Yeah, you know, uh, actually what, what we did at that time, just two, three days after I, I resumed office, I, I felt there was a need for me to set up a vision 
and let the world know what our visions will be. And um, the exchange, of course, you've, you'll observe that the primary mandate of Central Bank is financial and monetary stability. And of course, um, uh, issues bordering on inflation, prices, uh, interest rates, exchange rate stability, mm -hmm. uh, four core uh, as, as part of the mandates of the Central Bank of Nigeria. At that time, I, we felt, listen, that um, we didn't, uh, were not too happy uh, with the interest rate structure and that there was a need to bring interest rates um, to low levels. And we felt that during the five-year period, that was the vision that we had for five years, and we said during this five-year period, we will try as much as possible uh, to bring interest rates down. Uh, we are on the journey. We haven't quite attained the, uh, uh, the, the, the destination. We haven't quite reached the destination of saying bring interest rates down because you have to look at different parameters in the economy. You have to look at different macroeconomic variables to be able to say, yes, it's time to begin to look at it. But yes, unfortunately, in three years, we've struggled to see what can be done to bring interest rates lower, but we haven't been able to better. You have to look at different scenarios that confront you at different times and be able to say, yes, interest rates should come down. But unfortunately, we're not there yet, and I'm believing, I'm believing that at some point we will get there. Okay. Well, one of the things that we know today is that we're in a recession. We're still facing very high inflation. What are some of the things that got us here, and what are some of the things that are going to get us out of this situation? Well, you see, um, in 2008, 2009, that was when we had what I can call the beginning of the, the, the global shock that we, we, we saw. And Nigeria, just like very many other countries in the, in the world, um, has been faced with um, economic headwinds. Mm -hmm. And this economic headwind had to do primarily, one, um, with the fact that we saw um, a drastic drop in commodity prices, mm -hmm. and for Nigeria, a drop in the price of crude oil, which is, I, I use the word, our mainstay. And the, that drop in, the, in, in crude price from as high as $140 a barrel to at some point as low as $28 a barrel uh, naturally meant that our revenues from crude had to drop drastically. And with the revenue on, from crude dropping dr drastically, we didn't have a choice but to face the realities um, of, the, of, of, of our time. So that was, I say, one was uh, the drastic drop in commodity prices. Secondly, we, we've seen geopolitical tensions all around the, the world, geopolitical tensions around the trading routes in different parts of the world. And what happens when you have geopolitical tensions, like you have Russia, um, and Western powers or Iran, Saudi Arabia, sure, sure. what you find happening is that their flow of capital get impacted, whether positively or negatively. But in this case, for commodity exporting countries or for emerging markets, emerging and frontier markets, uh, we've seen flow of capital either reduced or indeed, in fact, reversed to the, uh, to the Western world. Mm -hmm. That also was contributory to it, has been contributory to this. But of course, um, the, third, the third reason um, is, is the U.S. Fed, United States Fed normalization. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen, uh, if you recall, around 2009, we started, uh, the United States Fed started what was called the uh, quantitative easing. Yes. Quantitative easing was, is like trying to stimulate the economy by injecting liquidity into mm -hmm. the system. In one fell swoop, the United States of America injected close to about $900 billion into, into its economy. And thereafter, it started what we call tapering. Mm. Okay, the period of tapering and, and quantitative easing meant that a lot of flows of funds were injected into, into the U.S. economy. And you've, because the U.S. economy is, is naturally the largest economy in the world, you find that those fl funds had to flow even outside, outside the United sure. States. Those funds flowed, flowed to... Um, Emerging markets and frontier markets like Nigeria, mm -hmm. and what was, that was why we saw some of those uh, funds flowing into, in, into our own area. But with normalization, the United States Fed started to sell assets and raise, raise rates. And that process of selling assets and raising rates naturally meant that there had to be flow reversal mm -hmm. back to the United States. To the extent that during the last quarter of 2016 alone, we saw almost close to about $48 billion flow from the emerging and frontier market back to the, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Western powers. That process naturally had to result in um, you know, alteration of capital flows and of course has its own adverse, adverse impact on the economies. And hence, we found ourselves in, the, in, in, in recession. But of course, um, 
of, of course, inflation also, also compounded our problem because uh, of the adjustment in the exchange rate. Um, at that time, it was about 155, mm -hmm. adjusted to 168, from 168 to 197, and 197, that's here where we are right now. When you find an adjustment in currency, naturally results in increase in prices mm -hmm. of goods. Okay, the increase in petroleum price from uh, from as low as 86 naira to the dollar also impacted. I mean, to 145 also naturally impacted on prices. Increase in energy prices like um, the tariff, electricity tariff also contributed to this. So that's why where where we are right now. But I think um, um, things are looking up. Uh, we've seen um, um, crude price sort of stabilize at between 45, sometimes 48, gets to 55 and all that. And given that budget has been pre pre predetermined at about 42 naira to the dollar, and also hoping that we're able to continue to um, achieve some stability in production, in, in production of crude and export of crude, then we should be able um, to get ourselves out of, out of, out of the situation. Um, <clears throat> you will also notice that inflation, inflation trended up from as low as about 9.9% uh, mm -hmm. in January of 20, 2017, no, of 2016, oh, of 2016, went to as high as almost 18.8% .8 as of December, January of 2017. And with the actions that have been taken, we've seen inflation trending downwards from about 18.8 to about 16.4%. 16.24 percent that it was uh, in the month of May. We are hoping that as we continue to see these these, these signs, uh, we should see some improvements in growth in the gross domestic product. And indeed, the signs are there. Mm -hmm. In 2016, we went through uh, the recession. Yes. Um, I would say yes. Well, unfortunately, we are seeing it, but we've seen uh, some improvements during the, during the fourth quarter of 20, um, 2016. 16. Um, growth was negative 1.72 percent, mm -hmm. but during the first quarter of uh, 2017, it improved to negative 0.52 percent. That is a massive improvement, and we're hoping that, uh, barring any um, shocks, here yeah, we're talking of exogenous or yes. internal shocks, if this trend continues, we should be out of out of out of the woods soon. Okay. We're going to take a short break. When I come back, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the shocks, and then we're going to get into, I'm sure, something that a lot of people want to hear about, which is around foreign exchange, because that's really a place where we've had a lot of activity and monetary policies, and we'd love to get some of your idea on some of the things that led to some of the decisions you made. Thank you. Um, we're heading for a short break here on The Morning Show, but we'll be right back with our special guest, Mr. Godwin Emefile, when we return. Thank you. Thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zines, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion, listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance, the most customer-focused bank in Nigeria, a success built on three foundations dedicated to people, technology, service. Zines Bank, in your best interest. Our customers are focused, versatile, superheroes. Our customers are also the most important people in our world. So we listen, partner, and give solutions that make a difference. First Bank, we will always put you first. You first. First Bank. Welcome back. This is Arise News Channel. You're watching The Morning Show with me, Biola Labi. Time now. Time now back to our guest in the studio, Mr. Amifile. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. One of the things you were talking about when we went on break was also about existential shocks in the system. One of the things we've been hearing is around commodity prices again. So there is a sense that oil prices aren't going to stabilize at sort of the 50 rate that they are, that there is still a possibility that 
oil prices will fall. How will we be insulated against having such the, the, a crisis like we had last time if oil prices do fall? Well, I, I think um, basically the, the point is that um, the, Nigeria has no, um, we don't have a choice, mm -hmm. but to think about how to diversify the economy away from, from heavily relying on oil. Yes. And, and it starts this way. I mean, um, when we grew up reading the economics of Nigeria, uh, there was a time when Nigeria survived without oil. Nigeria um, survived. Then we grew up to hear about granite pyramids in northern mm -hmm. part of the country. Mm -hmm. We grew up to, to hear about cocoa being exported out of the country. We grew up hearing that uh, the south, midwest, and the southeastern part of the country will produce palm oil mm -hmm. and export. Mm -hmm. Indeed, at that time, Nigeria was the largest producer of palm oil, with almost close to about 40% market share. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we found oil <laughs> and we let down our guts. Yes. What other countries who, who have this, I would say, who were blessed with oil have done? Take, for instance, Norway. Mm -hmm. Norway has one of the largest sovereign wealth investment funds in the world, yes. as high as almost, yes. almost close to about 900 billion, I, I know, and that is a country yes. um, of um, a population of... Um, Two million people, <laughs> I think. Less than five, <laughs> less, let's say less about, than five let's, million, let's say five million yeah. people. Yes. They're not well to produce this fish, right? So aside from their crude, which they save those investments and ensure that those investments, I mean, those revenues from crude are invested in infrastructure and all that, they also survive on the on a Greek, which mm -hmm. is fish in this case. Yes. So what I thought Nigeria should have done should have been don't let down your guards. Yes, you're very good. You're blessed with a good climate. You're blessed with good soil, and if you can if you can grow and export cocoa, if you can grow and export palm oil, if you can if you can grow your food. Continue to grow it, feed your people, and export it, and then earn revenues from it. Sure. At the same time, you also um, have um, revenues from crude, which you can use to grow your infrastructure, invest in your infrastructure, and develop your economy. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Well, mm -hmm. that is history now. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, because we've had the opportunity of surviving as a country, right, on revenues from non-oil sectors, yes. we do not have a choice but to diversify our revenue base from heavily relying on oil to these agricultural sectors. Fair uh, enough. Right. One of the things we've noticed, I mean, which is, this is a long plan. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a long-term plan. So in, in a way, it's great that, I mean, I know one of the things that your, the Central Bank has done is really focus on developing the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, People, come, people have come and they've complained about high interest rates. The people can't invest the way they want to invest. They can't get access to finance because of the interest rates. So one of the things I know you've, you've been uh, advocating is PAVE, which is what you just mentioned, which is produce, add value, and export. For us to really catalyze and almost sort of reinvest in the agricultural sector and rediscover this sort of export value, where are we going to get the in investments from, number one, and how are we going to get lower interest rates? Well, you see, um, the point first, first is that, like I said, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria has, over the last few decades, um, been involved in development finance activities. Yes. What that meant is that, and the Act gives the Central Bank the powers to do what it is mm -hmm. doing. So what Central Bank has done is to say, look, with some liquidity that it has at its disposal, let's make this available to fund say, agriculture through our commercial agricultural credit scheme. Let's make some of these, these funds available to micro, small, and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. These funds are lent out at single digits, single digits interest rates. So what we're saying is that, well, in the absence of us being able to, I would say, globally, I mean, within Nigeria overall, be able to achieve a low interest rate because agriculture or micro small businesses cannot grow at double digit. We have to accept that mm -hmm. fact. What we've done, what the central bank has done is to say, look, we have some funds set aside. And I can tell you that over the last 10 years, central bank has invested over 2 trillion naira, right? Funding agriculture, funding 
uh, micro, small and medium enterprises, funding manufacturing and enterprises that are, that are intent on, go on going into the agricultural space. That has been done over the last couple of years and we would continue to do so because we think that is what can be done to support our efforts towards um, diversifying the economy, growing food for our people and ensuring um, that we are uh, self-sufficient in our food production. So let me ask you, what is it that we need to do to almost sort of speed this process up, get more people into the sector? Because right now, there aren't enough people to really produce enough for Nigeria to consume and to export. And there doesn't seem to be enough encouragement or engagement with people actually going into production, manufacturing, or the incentive there. What is it that we need to do as Nigerians to get more people involved in the actual production and us being, a sustainable, being sustainable before we even think of exporting? Well, um, I don't agree that there aren't enough people. I mean, a country with a population of over 180 million people and um, where you have many of them being in farming, I think what has happened is that they haven't been encouraged in the past. People were producing for instance, palm oil, yes. right? People, uh, as a result of, of the fact that we found oil, uh, people began to migrate from the rural areas to the urban area, mm -hmm. urban centers and the rest. We need to do something to keep our people in the, in the rural areas, develop the rural areas, make, provide access roads, give them what they need to have to, ha to enjoy the comfort of life, even if, where, wherever they, they choose to stay, whether in the rural or the urban centers. Making this available, you also try to make sure that one way or the other, you make funding available to them, right? At, I repeat, single digit interest rates. Yes. Government, and I will come back to making funds available at single digit interest rates and then making funds available to the mass of people. But I think government themselves also have a right, have, have a responsibility to ensure that when these people produce food, those food, have to be sold mm -hmm. to one way or the other. Countries get involved in what they call trade wars. Mm -hmm. Those, there are some who find Nigeria as a very big market and what they want to do is come dump it on you and then, and then at, at low prices that will unfortunately send your farmers out of business. So government itself has its own role to play to say what can we do to give some form of Protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people don't like to hear protectionism. It's a story about protectionism, but you don't have a choice one way or the other but to protect your farmers. Uh, I mean, in different parts of the world, even in the United States, sure. people subsidize wheat. So they, even, they, they, give, they give farmers money to, 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 to say, produce the wheat, they will take the wheat off you, and then either will give them out or sell them at sure. cheap prices. Sure. So one way, those are one ways, those are some of the ways you could protect, protect your farmers. But what is important is that when those farmers produce, you must have or put in place a mechanism their hand buy it from them mm -hmm. so they can go back to farming. Mm -hmm. That mechanism we have we didn't put in place and that's why we find this year where they would produce because those those food couldn't be purchased, those food got they, they get rot, rot, rot away. Sure. And for that reason the, the, the incentive, the encouragement to go back to farming is not there. But what we are doing, what with, with what, what, what the government of President Buhari has done in the last two years is that, listen, we need to encourage our farmers again. And that was why in November 2015, he took us to Kirby State. Mm -hmm. And we started the journey towards ensuring that we're able to encourage farmers to go to the farms and, and grow rice, sure. wheat, and all types of maize. Sure. And today, we have achieved that. And we've achieved because when the farmers who never even thought that they could see a president, or who never thought they could see a governor, mm -hmm. who never thought they could see personalities in the country coming to them in the rural areas to say, look, we want to give you support one way or the other. It's a lot of encouragement to them. And by doing that, you make them go back sure. to the farm. Doing that, going back to the farm, they produce the rice, they produce the wheat, put in place a mechanism where those rice is bought off them, they can go back, and so that is the way you improve the wealth of your people. Mm -hmm. And that is what the government has done in the last two years. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to say that we've achieved some success in that direction. I believe so. I mean, I know that the, there's been a lot of positive, um, positive feedback on the rice 
um, scheme. And I think that there is also some movement on palm oil, um, but palm oil is obviously a long-term investment. And one of the things that we know is that there are also multinationals that are coming in to invest in the palm oil ecosystem. One of the things that we also need to do is sort of get more young people back to farming. I mean, farming was something that used to be a sort of a family trade. That's not happening anymore. So one of the things that you're saying is that we need to get government involved and we need to make sure government are able to protect and subsidize. But the other thing we need is infrastructure development. What do you think that we need to do around infrastructure? Because, for example, by the time tomato gets to the south from the north, there are no roads, there are no ways to get these things into people's hands. And I know we need to actually talk about foreign exchange, so we're gonna park that conversation. And if we have some time, I wanna pick that up with you. Because I know people are watching right now to talk to you more about that. So yeah. my first question around the foreign exchange policies and also the monetary policies that we've seen over the last three years that you've come to office, you said it in, the first, um, in one of your first statements, we went from 155 to 197, and then also kind of almost been in this place where we were going to free float and we weren't going to free float. What are some of the things that you believe that the, as, a, as a bank that you've done right in sort of dealing with the issues around the foreign exchange shortage? Well, I'll uh, also ask you what the okay, things that but, you wish but, you had but, done better. But you know, um, the, the point is that in the, we, like I said earlier, we're confronted by the economic headwinds. Sure which resulted in a drop in commodity, in, in commodity price, mm -hmm. and in this case, the price of crude from as high as 140 to as low as 28, and now sort of stabilizing at between, say, 47, 48 to about 55. Um, confronted with those challenge, where there, there, there wasn't enough, enough for Forex to meet the demand of those who needed to import, um, we took a couple of countervailing actions. Um, um, for instance, um, we had to adjust the currency mm -hmm. then from 155 to 168, 168 to 197, and now we're where we are um, right now. I haven't taken those decisions, and in it, indeed, those decisions were very painful because when you're adjusting currency, it, it has its own attendant negative impact on the economy and the rest of it. I haven't taken those, those actions. We've still felt, and we felt the essence of that is to encourage flow of funds into the country so supply can be deepened. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't quite achieve that. And so we had to look at um, other demand management measures. And uh, haven't, uh, haven't taken a few actions there of demand management where we had to say, look, there are certain items that um, if we can produce them in the country, that why really, why really um, import them? Why import them? Or why allocate foreign exchange for those purposes? And those were some of the actions that we took. And I must say that those demand management measures have worked. And that's why today we're talking about um, um, improving the wealth of our farmers and rice and palm oil and the rest of them. People are gradually get going back, back to them. But of course, haven't, t haven't taken price on. We've also taken on demand. Sure. At some point, you needed to come back and look at what, what we need to do something about supply. Mm -hmm. And what we've done in the last couple of, in June 2016, we, we, we introduced the flexible foreign exchange market uh, scheme. And uh, since then, we've been, try, we've, been, we've been adopting different schemes mm -hmm. towards ensuring that it succeeds. And I must say that what we've done during that period, um, in, in, we, we try to dissect the market to say where, what is responsible for the hike in the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And we kept looking at the various uh, factors contributed to that. And I must say that luckily, we've been able to, 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 to track it. And at this stage, um, taking some of the action that we've taken between, say, the beginning of this year up till this time, you could see the exchange rate dropping from as high as 520 to a range of between 360, some 357, to as high, maybe 365, 366 that it is right now, is because of the action that we have taken. Okay. Um, basically to see to it that how do we ensure that the Central Bank of Nigeria is not the only contributor of foreign exchange yes. into the economy. And in the last 10 weeks, for instance, we've seen um, flus uh, returning back into the country. Uh, over uh, over $2.5 billion mm -hmm. has come in. What that tells us is that, well, we need to do a, a few more things. And I'm believing that as we do some of those okay. things, 
Improving I'm going to go to break, but yes. when I come back, we're also going to talk about the the um, 41 items that you mentioned in your in um, and talk about sort of what what are the, what what did we expect and what can we expect going forward with some of these items. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back. Yeah. Time now for a short break on the morning show, and we'll be back with the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 